Hello everyone. <coughs> we are starting with uh, the chapter discovering Tut, the saga continues. <coughs> the saga. Saga is uh, a sort of narrative which is uh, continued from uh, in, a, in a form of tradition from one generation to another generation and so on. Now why this has been mentioned as saga continues? Because since the time Tutankhamun in the short he is known as King Tut, the golden boy, his tomb was discovered. Since then there have been many assumptions, there have been many guessworks related to his life and death and all and it still continues to uh, captivate the researchers, the Egyptologists and so on and it's still going on. This chapter actually tells us about the research work which was carried on with uh, the help of National Geographic and Society, the magazine that you all know and uh, to find out the more details about this mysterious boy pharaoh. It also gives us an insight of the little bit of the historical background and the research work which was carried out. He was just a teenager when he died, the last heir of powerful family that had ruled Egypt and its empire for centuries. He was led to rest laden with gold and eventually forgotten. Since the discovery of his tomb in 1922, the modern world has speculated about what happened to him with murder being the most extreme possibility. Now leaving his tomb for the first time in almost 80 years, Tut has undergone a CT scan that offers new clues about his life and death and provides precise data for an acute, accurate forensic reconstruction of the boy's pharaoh. So this is just the foreword for this chapter. There have been so many assumptions and all that. So, the day that was January 5, 2005, when this uh, work was taken over, an angry wind steered up ghostly dust devils as King Tut was taken from his resting place in the ancient Egyptian cemetery known as Valley of the Kings. Valley of the Kings is actually the place where uh, many of the pharaohs where uh, buried, uh, the, the tomb of many of the pharaohs have been uh, created over there. Now that day, the weather was a little bit rough. Dark bellied clouds had scudded across the desert sky all day and now were wheeling the stars in casket gray. It was 6 p.m. on January 5, 2005. The world's most famous mummy glided headfirst into a city scanner brought here to probe the lingering mystery, medical mysteries, lingering, which was still unanswered, it was still going on, of this little understood young ruler who died more than 3,300 years ago. Now all afternoon, the usual line of tourists from around the world had descended into the cramped, rock-cut tomb some 26 feet underground to pay their respects. They guessed at the mural, mural is the wall painting of the burial chamber. Everyone was silent. Even when they talked, they talked in whisper. Maybe they were wondering with Shiva if the Pharaoh's curse. Now, with every Pharaoh there has been curse uh, put over there, it is, it is just a story related to them. The death or misfortune falling upon those who disturbed him. So everyone, everyone who was present over there was thinking about this, whether it was true or it was just a story. When the mummy was, the casket was open, Jai Hawass, the Secretary General of Egypt's Supreme Council of Antiquities, as we have ASI, Archaeological Survey of India, similarly in Egypt, it is uh, Egypt's Supreme Council of Antiquities and its Secretary General, Jai Hawass, when he looked at the mummy, he said that it is in very bad condition. And it was because of what Carter did in 1920s. Carter, Howard Carter, 
was the British archaeologist who, nine, who in 1922 discovered Tut's tomb after years of futile searching. Almost, almost 20 years he spent and finally he stumbled upon this tomb which was undiscovered till that time. Its content, though hastily ransacked in antiquity, were surprisingly content and it was one of the tombs where the things were found intact. They remain the richest royal collection ever found and have become the part of Pharaoh's legend. Stunning artifacts in gold. Their eternal brilliance meant to guarantee resurrection. Resurrection is the life after death. Caused a sensation at the time of the discovery and still gets the most attention. But it was also buried with everyday things he would want in afterlife. So it was generally a tradition in Egypt. They felt that uh, there was afterlife and so the pharaohs and important persons they were mummified and they were kept in the pyramids in the tombs and with them the things which were used in everyday life was also kept board games bronze laser razor linen undergarments cases of food and wine everything was with there after months of carefully recording the pharaoh's funerary treasure, funerary treasure means the treasure, the things which were kept with pharaoh after, during his funeral, Carter began investigating his three nested coffins. Opening the first, he found a shroud adorned with garland of willow and olive leaves, wild celery, lotus petal and corn flowers, the, fatal, uh, the faded evidence of burial in March or April. So all these things which were there, maybe uh, these were the things which were uh, found during that particular part of the time of the year, which were kept with the pharaoh. And uh, it gives a suggestion that most probably the burial was done in March or April. But when he finally reached the mummy, he ran into trouble. The ritual resin, resin, resin is gum. Now there are two words, R-E-S-I-N and R-A-I-S-I-N. Though the pronunciation is almost the same, but they are different. R-E-S-I-N is the natural gum or the gum which is uh, extracted from the trees and all that. And R-A-I-S-I-N is the dried grape, the dried grape. The, the dried grape which is uh, there. Now this ritual resins had hardened, cementing to, to the bottom of his solid gold coffin. No amount of legitimate force could move them. Carter wrote later, what was to be done? He tried every force, but then he could not move the mummy out of the coffin. So that resin had actually <coughs> uh, created the problem. It was almost 3,000 years ago when the mummy was led to rest. And because of that resin, it had stuck to the bottom of the coffin and that created problem for Howard Carter. Now in that part of Egypt, the sun uh, can beat down like a hammer. Carter tried to loosen the resins. For several hours, he kept the mummy outside in the blazing sunshine that heated it to 149 degrees Fahrenheit, but nothing happened. And then finally, he reported with scientific detachment that the consolidated matter had to be chiseled away from the beneath from beneath the limbs and trunk before it was possible to raise the king's remain. In his defense, <coughs> Carter really had a little choice. He had no choice than this particular method because if he hadn't, the, if he hadn't cut the mummy free, there were chances that because uh, these uh, tombs, they were full of riches and the news would, uh, um, was now everywhere that the tomb was found and the treasure which was found and there was chances that there were chances that the thieves would circumvent, somehow escape the guards posted over there, enter the tomb and try to take away the riches from there. And in that, as they were more important, they would be more uh, in interested in the riches. For them, the mummy was of no value. For Carter, the mummy was of value because he was an archaeologist. <clears throat> they would have destroyed the mummy. So in order to keep the mummy safe, he had no other choice but to chisel away the things. 
Now in Tut's time, the royals were fabulously wealthy and they thought or hoped they could take their riches with them. For his journey to the great beyond, King Tut was lavished with glittering goods, precious collars, inlaid necklaces and bracelets, rings, amulets, a ceremonial apron, sandals, sheets for his fingers and toes, and the now iconic inner coffin and mask, all of pure gold. Now to separate Tut from his adornments, Carter's men removed the mummy's head and severed, severed means cut, nearly every major joint. Once they had finished, they reassembled the remains on a layer of sand in a wooden box with padding that concealed the damage. The bed where Tut now rests. Now this was the reason why Jai Havas commented that the mummy was in bad condition. But Carter had no choice. Carter had no choice. He had to do it. And that actually did some damage to the mummy. Now since then, archaeological, archaeology has changed substantially. It is earlier, archaeology was more interested in finding the treasure. It was treasure hunting actually. But then, from treasure hunting, it uh, shifted to finding out the fascinating details of life and intriguing mysteries of death. And as with the advancement of science and the medical tools, medical technology, the things, these things started to be included. In 1968, almost 40 years after Carter's discovery, an anatomy professor x-rayed the mummy and revealed a startling fact. Beneath the resin that cakes his chest, his breastbone and front ribs are missing. Today, diagnostic imaging can be done with computed tomography, or in short, we know, know it as CT, by which hundreds of X-rays in cross-section are put together like slices of bread to create a three-dimensional virtual body. What more would a CT scan reveal of Tut than the X-ray? And could it be answer two of the biggest questions still lingering about him? How did he die? And how old was he at the time of his death? Now, King Tut's demise, death was a very big event, even by the royal standards. He was the last of his family's line, and his funeral was the death rattle of a dynasty. But the particulars of his passing away and its aftermath are unclear. Amenhotep III, Tut's father or grandfather, was a powerful pharaoh who ruled for almost four decades. Now, this is the historical part. <clears throat> who ruled for almost four decades at the height of 18th dynasty's golden age. His son, Amenhotep IV, succeeded him and initiated one of the strangest period in the history of ancient Egypt. The new pharaoh promoted the worship of Athene, the sun disk, changed his name to Aten, which means servant of Athene, and moved the religious capital from the old city of Thebes to the new city of Aten, now known now as Amarna. He further shocked the country by attacking Amun, a major god, smashing his images and closing his temple. So he, he tried to change the tradition. Ray Johnson, who is the director of the University of Chicago's Research Center in Luxor, says, comments, it must have been a horrific time. The family that had ruled for centuries was coming to an end. And, and then Akhenaten went a little wacky, wacky, crazy, because he was trying to do something which was against the established custom and tradition of the time. Now, after Akhenaten's death, a mysterious ruler named Smenkere appeared briefly and exited with hardly a trace. And then a very young Tutankhaten took the throne, the King Tut, as he is widely known today. The boy king soon changed his name to Tutankhamun, living image of a moon, and oversaw a restoration of the old ways. He reigned for about nine years and then died unexpectedly. <clears throat> now, there must have been someone who would have been the, uh, who would have been guiding this little boy. And so, just to establish the trust of the kingdom, he must have again changed his name and he would have tried to restore the old traditions and customs. And first of all, his name was changed from Tutankhaten to Tutankhamun, that is living image of Amun. But then, this boy ruled for nine years and he, then he died unexpectedly. And now this death, which actually has created so much of 
assumptions and guesswork. Regardless of his fame and speculation about his fate, Tut is one mummy among many in Egypt. How many? No one knows. The Egyptian mummy project, which began an inventory in late 2003, has recorded almost 600 so far and is still counting. The next phase. Now, what is this Egyptian mummy project? First, finding out the mummies. And then, scanning the mummies with a portable CT machine donated by National Geographic Society and Siemens, its manufacturer. King Tut is one of the first mummies to be scanned, in death as in life, moving regally ahead of his countrymen. Now, what does this line mean? In life, he was the king, so he was the leader of his countrymen. And now, in his death, his mummy was one of the first mummies to be scanned. So in death also, he was leading the way. A city machine scanned the mummy head to toe, creating 1,700 digital X-ray images in cross-section. Tut's head scanned in 0.62 millimeter slices to register its intricate structures. Takes on eerie detail, huh? something uh, which fills someone with awe or some sort of, what you can say, uh, fear or something like that. With Tut's entire body similarly recorded, a team of specialists in radiology, forensics and anatomy began to probe the secrets that the winged goddesses of gilded burial shrine protected for so long. The night of the scan, <clears throat> the workmen carried Tut from the tomb, tomb in his box, like pallbearers. Pallbearers are those who carry the coffin. They climbed a ramp and a flight of stairs into the swirling sand outside, then rose on a hydraulic lift into the trailer that held the scanner. Twenty minutes later, two men emerged, sprinted for an office nearby, and returned with a white plastic fan. The million-dollar scanner had quit because of sand in a cooler fan. Now, there was sand in the cooler fan, and it was not working. So, they returned with a pair of white plastic fans, so that the machine could be kept enough cool to complete the work. Now, the guards who were standing over there, they were, every, everyone was nervous, everyone was nervous. Everyone who was involved in the whole thing was nervous. They joked nervously, curse of the Pharaoh. Huh? Maybe the Pharaoh was angry and his peace has been disturbed and that's why the hindrances are created. Eventually, the substitute fans worked well enough to finish the procedure. After checking that no data had been lost, the technician's turn took over to the workman who carried him back to his tomb. Less than three hours after he was removed from his coffin, the pharaoh again rested in peace where the funerary priest had laid him so long. So after all the procedure was completed, he was sent back to his original resting place. Back in the trailer, a technician pulled up astonishing images of Tut on a computer screen. A grey head took shape from the scattering of pixels. And I hope every one of you know what pixels are. And the technician spun and tilted it in every direction. Neck vertebrae appeared as clearly as in an anatomy class. Other images revealed a hand, several views of the ribcage, and a transection of the skull. But for now, the pressure was off. Sitting back in his chair, Jai Havas smiled, visibly relieved that nothing had gone seriously wrong. I didn't sleep last night for a second, not for a second, he said. I was so worried, but now I think I will go and sleep. So <clears throat> that shows the uh, mental status of everyone who was involved in that. Everyone was tense, everyone was nervous. Now everyone was relaxed after the thing was completed successfully. By the time we left the trailer, descending metal stairs to the sandy ground, the wind had stopped. The winter air lay cold and still like death itself. In this valley of the departed, just above the entrance to Tut's tomb stood Orion, the constellation that the Egyptian, ancient Egyptian knew as the soul of Osiris, the god of the afterlife, watching over the boy king. Now, just compare the weather condition in the beginning and weather condition at the end. Everyone was tense and so the weather was also, the weather also seemed to, uh, what you can say, uh, tell about the feeling that everyone was. Now everything was done, everything was, everyone was calm, everyone was relaxed, and so was the weather. The weather was clear, the sky was clear, <clears throat> the stars were seen, 
and they could see Orion, the constellation. Constellation is a group of stars. The ancient Egyptians knew as the soul of Osiris, the god of the afterlife, watching for the boy king. <clears throat> this is one of the, what you can see, if you, if you go on various sites, you will find this particular research work, scanning of Tut's mummy. It was, it was to <clears throat> actually find out what was the reason behind uh, Tut's death. There have been many uh, guesswork, guessing, uh, guessing and assumptions that he was murdered or he died with a disease or something like that. But the findings, they say that maybe he had, <coughs> had an accident and which uh, resulted in damage to his leg and uh, before uh, medication and everything could be given, he died because of infection that was a result of that particular accident. And uh, this is still, the research work is going on, still the things are going on and still uh, people are trying to find various conclusions related to the life and death of this famous boy pharaoh, Tutankhamen or known as King Tut. That's all for the chapter.